What's up, everybody? I'm here with my new friend, Eric. Eric, it's a pleasure to have you on. We met on a Facebook page for books. Who are you and what do you do? Uh, my name is Eric Herrera. I am a uh, U.S. Army veteran, and um, I've been out for about 10 years now. Um, but one of the main things with COVID going on, uh, I also wanted to write a book about my experiences. So um, I have a book right now. Out. It's called uh, A Bomb Hunter Story, My Life Clearing the Roads of Iraq. Yeah, and it's, um, I mean, I, I don't even know where to start because this is such, um, and I'm, I'm reading the summary of your book on Amazon, which you got everyone should buy now. The link will be down below in the video description. It's like, you know, where, where do you start? Um, one of the things, you know, what made you want to join the military and, um, you know, what was your experience like when you first got in there? I, I had no intention of uh, joining the military. Um, I got kicked out of college, so uh, I didn't really have any options. I wasn't going to stay at home, uh, so I decided to join. And probably one of the better things that I've done with my life. So why would you get kicked out of college, if you don't mind me asking? Uh, too much partying. 19, <laughs> man. I was, rooming with my best friend that was the worst thing to do so everything oh, went yeah. downhill from there my sweet mate my my first year i stayed in the dorms and my sweet mate was a weed dealer and i didn't i didn't smoke back then <laughs> back then and uh, <laughs> and i was so nervous because one day we me and my roommate got back to our dorm and a cop's like is there any weed in this room and we're like no, there's no weed in this room. He's like, are you sure? Because if there is, you're going to be in a lot of trouble. And we're like, no. And yeah, he, he almost got kicked out of school. So, hey, look, when you're, college is a scary thing to do when you're young and you're on your own for the first time, especially when you're young, you like to party, you know? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, when I got out, I did a bunch of odd jobs. And then um, the military paid for my college degree. But by that time, I was 25, 26. So, um, my head was more focused and ended up getting my bachelor's in three and a half years, something like that. Oh, wow. What's your bachelor's in? Uh, business administration. Wow. So now I'm a property manager. It's a whole different ball game from what I did in the military. Yeah, definitely. Um, so like, what was the, what's the technical term for what you did? Is it bomb hunter? Um, well, my job was a combat engineer. Um, but over the years it's, uh, it's evolved um, in World War One, World War Two. Combat engineers used to clear minefields, and um, in my basic training, that's what we did. We would clear um, mining obstacles, things like that. Um, it wasn't until I got to my unit in Germany that they told us what we were going to be doing, and that's a whole other other thing. We're not, we don't got mine. Uh, we don't have mine detectors or anything like that. We're just running around in vehicles looking for bombs. Oh man, I mean, I can't even imagine how scary that is. Uh, well, what branch were you in, by the way? I was in the army. Um, yeah, as a combat engineer, oh, I can't tell you the um, the technical number because yeah. since I've been out, it's changed back and forth because it is a combat MOS, and they um, keep changing the numbers back and forth. But as of recently now, I think now they're letting females be combat engineers. And that was, that wasn't even a thought when I was around. Oh, well, cool. Good for them. Good for, uh, <laughs> glad they were able to do that. So you're, so you didn't even know you're going to be clearing moms before they told you you're going to start doing that. No, we, uh, another thing that we do is, um, also breach buildings. So what we learned was, uh, um, how to make explosives is to breach doors. We're basically breachers. That's another word for us. So a lot of our field rotations would be building little makeshift uh, um, bombs to blast down doors or walls or whatever we needed to get into. Um, what was it? Yeah, World War II, they used to use Bangalores. So we'd practice with those and it was, it was a fun job. <laughs> oh yeah, I, I bet. And you know, I bet it's also just incredibly scary and nerve wracking. I, I want, I, I want people to know what the book is about. Um, you know, without giving too much away, of course, can you tell people 
I guess, like a summary of the, of the book, um, just so they know what they're getting into if they buy it. Um, yeah, it's, I start out how I ended up coming to the decision. Um, I talk briefly about my time in basic training, because um, there, there was a lot of details in that, but I mainly brought up the main points of what we had to deal with and things like that. Um, I ended up being stationed in Germany my entire time. So um, did about a year and a half in Germany. And then we got deployed in 2005 for 15 months to Iraq. Uh, so bad, but when we were there, it was Baghdad. Um, I stayed in Germany. Uh, I didn't want to go anywhere else. I'd rather have stayed in Germany. I didn't want to come back to the States. Um, so I ended up staying there and then ended up doing another uh, 12 month tour again in, uh, uh, in an area called Hilla. Um, it's about an hour and a half south of Baghdad. It's um, where Saddam had uh, all his mass graves that they found. Oh, wow. So, uh, and then like right down the road is Babylon, the ruins of Babylon. So that we used to be able to pass by it all the all the time. So that was probably pretty neat. And then, um, but toward my second deployment, I was getting older and I had more priorities. I was starting a family, things like that. And I got out. Uh, my family was more important at the time. So then uh, my struggle was going through that as well. Yeah, definitely. Uh, one of the things that's stuck out to me as you were, spe were speaking was you didn't want to go back to the States. You wanted to stay in Germany. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Uh, I caught wind um, that I was going to be sent to Fort Hood. And um, we actually had engineers that were with us from Fort Hood. And they said, don't come here. Don't go to Hood. And that this was before all this things that you're going to see. And now this was even before the shooting that happened uh, a couple years back. So oh, it was yeah. still bad. Um, they were like, no. And a lot of those guys from Fort Hood ended up coming to Germany for our, my second deployment. So I didn't want to go to Hood. Um, I rather, it's a funny thing. I rather get, uh, rather get screwed by people I know than people I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. That, is Fort Hood the place where all that stuff's happening right now? Yeah. That's where oh, the, man. the missing girl. Yeah. Or oh, where they wow. found her, but yeah. And there were, yeah, they think there might be a serial killer there, I, I believe. Uh, no, it ended up being uh, someone she worked with. Oh, okay. They found out who it was. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's wild, man. So, yeah, I'm glad you – I mean, I guess it's good you didn't have to, you didn't have to go there. But uh, so a lot of people – you know, the reason I have people like yourself on this podcast is to show people you know, perspectives they're not used to. I've had, like, Senate, you know, Senate candidates on here – um, Olympic wrestlers. Well, what, one thing that really interests me is like, what goes through your mind when you're told, okay, you're about to be deployed. Um, what are you even thinking? Is it, you know, are, are you worried about your life? Are you worried about people back home? What are the things you're thinking about when you get sent out like that? Well, I was 19 and um, I really didn't have anything. It was just me, just me and my bags. And um, it's strange filling out your will at 19 years old. So it's, that was a big eye opener, um, things like that. Um, I, I talk about the struggles of family of, of soldiers that do have family. I, things happen and I mean, it's just a real, real hard to see. And I couldn't, I can never imagine doing that to my family. That was one of the reasons why I ended up getting out of the military. Yeah. Um, I, and something I, it's getting talked about more, but people don't really truly understand like the, uh, the mental health effects that going to, uh, you know, a battle, a war zone can have on somebody think, you know, people in the military come back, veterans come back with PTSD, anxiety, depression. So many of them are, are killing themselves. Uh, how have you, you know, how, how have you been dealing with everything mentally? Are there things that you do to keep yourself centered? Do you meditate? Things like that. Um, that's another thing I talk about. Um, a lot of the times the military would give us anxiety pills or depression pills. And I would see a lot of, a lot of guys would take it and there would be zombies that just blank faces, just not there. And I never wanted to be like that. I, I refused medication. 
I rather deal with it my own way. And the past couple of years, I have had to deal with it. Um, uh, things with other people that I know are dealing with it heavily now because since uh, my first deployment, uh, we lost a couple of guys. And um, over the years now, they're having a hard time dealing with it. And a lot of, uh, a lot of stories are coming out that um, some are true, some aren't. So when I wrote this book, I wanted to set the record straight on what actually happened. And um, cause I was there for all the incidences that happened. And I just wanted to bring closure to a lot of the families that lost sons, husbands and things like that. And um, the book put me at peace with a lot. I used to have nightmares all the time. And um, for ever since I wrote the book, it's been nine, 10 months now. I don't have any nightmares anymore. I have more of a clean conscience. And that's another reason why I want to come out and say stuff like this is like, hey, you could do it yourself, but if you need help, ask for it. I talk to buddies around the world that are, and uh, they help me out with things like that. I help them out, things they're going through. And it's just, uh, you just got to keep in touch. I mean, now with zoom and everything like that it's a lot easier now to keep in touch you're not doing it by letters and telephone or something like that i mean there's resources out there you just have to look for them and then ask a friend yeah absolutely reach out no one's ever going to be upset if you reach out and if they are are they really your friend type of yeah. deal yeah exactly and it's good that you guys have that community and you're you feel so um akin to each other and familial and that's it's really great to hear that you were also able to help give families closure. Um, you know, is there is there a lack of closure for a lot of military families? Um, yes and no. Uh, sometimes you're not given the full story. And I found out that some families weren't. And that kind of made me really upset. So the incidents, all those incidences I wrote in my book I gave my version. I know there's a lot of other guys that have, that have their versions and they're entitled to it, but I'm going to give my version the best I can and tell the truth because why, why lie? I mean, it just makes things worse. Yeah. And you kind of just, if you, if you lie, it also puts yourself in this kind of perpetual wheel where you have to keep running on it. And if you can't sustain the lie, you fall off. Mm -hmm. uh, to use, I guess, a hamster as a metaphor. So what, I'm so shocked. I didn't know that the military uh, was giving out like these medications and things. And I, I take medications. I, I used to take this medication called Lexapro and I definitely felt like a zombie when I was taking it. Did you, did you see these pills uh, like negatively or, or even helping um, people? Like, was it, was it working? Do you think that it was bad that uh, a lot of these you know, our peers were taking these medications. Um, my, I think I believe it was my roommate at the time. I don't know if he was taking it because of that, but he, it wasn't. He was just becoming violent, and I'm like, dude, this is not you. I mean, what are you taking? And uh, right away, he's like, all right, I got to stop because yeah, you're telling me that I'm being violent. I'm not a violent guy. I'm like, yeah. So, um, things like that. I, I mean, I don't know what what they were given. I mean, this is over ten. 10, 12 years ago. So I really don't know what it was, but yeah, I mean, sometimes it does help guys, you know, but um, yeah, I'm, I really can't speak about that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so what do you think the government or the military could do to provide better mental health care for our military? I think they do. I mean, they, I mean, the, the classes, I mean, I mean, you think in the workplace, you think your, your job has all these briefings and everything like that. We have briefings about five, ten different things in one day. And it's usually because someone did something stupid and the next day we have a briefing on don't do that. So, I mean, they, there's a lot of things out there that they keep reassuring them and it does help and to get the resources. I mean, I, we had a, I was in Germany on a tiny base and the, all, we had a lot of resources that could help us out on anything that we needed. Okay, that, that is reassuring to hear for sure. 
Uh, yeah, so, yeah, that, that's about since I was in Germany, I can't speak for the states because I, I was never stationed in a um, uh, in a U.S. military base in the states. The bases in the U.S. are huge. I mean, take Fort Hood for example; their square mileage is bigger than the city of Chicago. So, I mean, that, that's a huge base. And yeah, I think Fort Hood. Fort Hood has about like sixty-five thousand troops or something like that. In Germany, my base, we only had 5,000, and we were in a small town in Germany, and there was more soldiers there than there were German nationals. So, I mean, to think about that, it's it's a major difference. Oh, yeah, and a lot of the military bases in the States are basically like cities, like you said, yeah. like Fort Hood. Um, I forget the name of the – it's it's a naval base down in Virginia. It's huge. The, like the whole – Virginia Beach in Norfolk, it's basically just a big military town. Um, I'm right by, I don't know if you're familiar with Picatinny Arsenal. I'm right by it. I hear bombs going off all the time because it's like right here. So I want to talk a little bit about what the process is of, of finding mines. You know, what, what kind of vehicles are you using? How do you do this type of thing? Um, yeah, so uh, we were using um, these uh, – vehicles that weren't even U.S. Um, they were South African vehicles that uh, diplomats use because they would get blown up too. So they use these special vehicles um, to prevent that. So we ended up using them and they're huge, um, huge vehicles. Um, I'm not sure if you ever seen uh, the first Transformers movie. No. No? Um, well, I, ha I have one right here. Hold on. Hold on. Perfect. Our our main our main vehicle is called the Buffalo, and if you could, so oh wow, this is this is from the movie Transformers. Um, this is what the Buffalo actually is, and on the top we have this this um, fork looking thing. So every any time we would be finding a bomb, we would take these forks and dig at it, pick it up. I mean, insurgents would put uh, things in trash bags, dead dogs, um, anything they could think of. So what we would have to do is drive five miles an hour down the road and stare out the window and try to find these IEDs. Um, a lot of them would be camouflaged with the curves. Like they would literally take a chunk out of the curb and put it in there and plaster it all up, make it look real nice like a curb, and you wouldn't even know the difference. I mean, it would be that sophisticated what these people would do. And it didn't help um, in Baghdad, the medians are filled with trash. I mean, it's like mini landfills. So you're <laughs> trying to go down the road, trying to see if there's a bomb in a bag or anything like that. But we would drive down these roads so much that we would spot trash that was out of the ordinary or out of place. and um, nine times out of 10, we would stop and it would end up being a IED of some sort. How do you, how do you even, yeah. How do you even figure it out? If it's like in the, in the concrete, like, how are you able to even spot that, especially from the, from the vehicle? Is there, is there any sort of like sensors that you guys are using to pick up on that? No, no, no sensors. Um, we would have precautions, um, a lot of uh, a lot of the IEDs would either be detonated by cell phone or beeper, um, pressure wire, um, uh, infrared sensors. So they would have uh, a sensor that would detect heat, and when it, and most likely the engine of the vehicle would go by it, and it senses that heat and it would set off the IED. Um, or they would have pressure wires on the ground. Most of the time it would be Christmas lights laying in the middle of the road. And what are Christmas lights doing, doing in the middle of the road? You step over that and it would detonate whatever um, would come by. Or they use a cell phone called the cell phone that's on the IED and end up uh, detonating it, things like that. Oh my God, that's, that is intense and it is scary and, you know, did it, did it remind you, you know, how lucky you are sometimes? Because I'm just thinking how lucky I am to live in the States and I don't, you know, I'm so fortunate. I don't have to deal with that, you know, 
you know, the citizens that are there and, and the, the military personnel that are over there. That's something you guys have to worry about all the time. And just here, you know, I can order DoorDash if I want to. And there it's just like, oh, I have to be careful that I don't step on a Christmas light or the wrong, you know, be in the wrong place at the wrong time. No, it took me a while when I would come back from leave. Um, I'd be driving down the road five miles an hour in my own car. People would be honking at me. I'd see a little piece of trash in the road and I would veer into the other lane because just that mentality um, to it got to a point where when I would come home, I wouldn't even drive. I'd walk or have someone else drive me because just the paranoia of it all. Um, I, I've been fortunate enough not to get hurt. I've been blown up uh, twice uh, while I was there. Uh, some guys have, and I know in my unit, three or four times. Um, but that's just the thing. Um, my first deployment, we ended up finding over 126 IEDs. Um, that's not including the ones that blown up on us or fake ones. So, so yeah, you just said you got blown up a couple times. What do you mean by what do you mean by that? Um, yeah, I have a chapter in my book. Um, since I live in Chicago, uh, well, it was 2006. Yeah, 2006 was when the Bears were in the Super Bowl playing the Colts. I ended up getting blown up on that day and ended up missing the Super Bowl. I wrote that. It's a chapter in my book. So wait, blown, blown up means like the, the, the bomb explodes while you're picking it up or you're like while you're in the vicinity as, as a person, you're not in the Buffalo. Uh, we, we didn't notice. We didn't notice that there was an IED. It was underneath a traffic cone. Oh. And ended, up, ended up blowing our the vehicle I was in. So I... I wrote about my experience doing that and just the mental state that I was in and things like that. And, did you, did you get hurt at all from that? No. Okay. Spoil, spoiler alert. I'm still here. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But you know, that's, that's rough. And, and for the people who didn't see um, Eric showed what the Buffalo looks like, it looks like something out of star Wars. It, it's this big truck. Yeah, so, yeah. It's right there. It has a big, uh, for the audio listeners, it has, like three wheels on each side and it looks like an extra wheel there and it has a big claw on the top of it kind of yeah, like so a, it's uh yeah that this this has a double claw on it it would only be like this little single claw mm -hmm. but yeah we, we call it a spork because that's the best one name we could come up with it is yeah it does look like a spork but i mean yeah but you could to tell how high this vehicle is um, this is this is the ladder we had to climb up to actually get mm -hmm. into it. I think it, the vehicle, I forgot what it is, is maybe um, 25, 30 feet tall or something like that. That's what the vehicle is. Oh, wow. That's like a house. <laughs> yeah. So it's like, yeah, it's a big vehicle. So were you in, were you, were you talking to the, the citizens of Iraq at all? Like how, you know, how did they feel about, you know, Americans being there? How did they feel about, you know, the, the potential terror threats? What was it, what was it like for the people living there? Um, we would talk with people once in a while. Um, that wasn't our job, uh, but we would have translators. We had, uh, two translators. Um, they would, they would let us know if we naturally needed to talk to somebody, but nine times out of 10, we rarely talked to anybody. Um, but I mean, uh, we would have interpreters there. Yeah, they, they would tell us our, their stories, like our, our family was taken hostage. I had my brother killed or my sister killed, my mother killed. So I, I wanted to help. Um, so they, they all have their stories, but um, yeah, there, there's some that um, they would scream and yell at us if we're going down the road or something like that. I mean, I don't, I don't blame them. I mean, <laughs> it's a, it's a war zone. So, I mean, there, there's not going to be all happy people and not all mad people. So is what it is yeah and you really kind of got to see the you know the, the the real you were there a lot of times in the media when we see you know people reacting to um, americans to having a base in another country they're they're all really mad but some of them weren't some of them were uh, same things like when people see media from america they'll probably just see all the bad stuff that's happening here right now mm -hmm. they're not going to see conversations like this they're not going to see people having a good conversation at the grocery store. Um, do, do you think traveling to all these places, Germany, Iraq, do you, do you feel like it kind of humanized the rest of the world for you? Not that you thought they were inhuman or anything, but is it kind of, you know, do you get a different perspective on humanity? 
Uh, yeah, I do. Um, that's one one thing I I un, I have a hard time seeing in people, and also understand at the same way. I mean, they some people say that we live in a terrible country sometimes. I'm like, well, <laughs> have you ever been anywhere else? I'm, I'm I can guarantee you it is nothing like here. Um, I know, and and even in Germany, I mean, there's different taxes and things like that that people would hear would be like, really, they pay taxes on that, and 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 they, um, even being in Iraq, I mean, it, you you could tell the certain areas. I mean, in Baghdad, since it was a big city, there would be schools there and things like that, and um, you would see the women go to schools. It'd be mostly women going to schools, and then all of a sudden you here the next day uh, there was a shooting up at that school or because they didn't want the women going to school there or things like that just I mean we we would have uh, I mean there'd just be uh, people that just had their differences and then they shoot them and then just leave them in the streets and then it's just uh, it's a I know it's a touchy subject about it all but it's it's what it is I just yeah, yeah it, would, it would benefit a lot of people if they did travel and see or go go live in another country i mean experience it i mean that's a hell of an experience to go live in another country you learn a lot from other people and how other people live i think people would get a better understanding about things if they did that oh yeah absolutely and um uh, i almost started crying when you talked about the uh the the girls going to school and they they got there was a shooting just because they were going to the school and I can't even like, we can't even imagine like there's school shootings here, but we can't even imagine what that's like just because women are going to school. Like that's just so hard to comprehend. And yeah, I agree. If you can, and if you have the opportunity to, I think, you know, everyone should probably live out of the country for a little bit or at least travel to see how things are like. And um, I've been lucky enough to travel and you, you see how different places are, but you also see how similar people are. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, there's good, there's mostly good people. There's some bad people and they're really bad, but most, from what I've seen, just like most, and I've been doing this podcast for a couple months with a few people from all over the country and the world. Most people are pretty much the same. And most people really just want the same thing, no matter what the media says. I mean, that, that shit's really not real. What's real is conversation. What's real is reading a book like yours, like true stories, listening to people's real stories not things that are sensationalized just to sell you something. Oh, yeah, because everyone has the same values. They want a better life, and I mean, how can you blame them? I mean, and I believe we're, yeah, we live in the greatest country here because you could be whatever you want here. Um, you go to other countries, you say no, just because your religion or things like that. And Because um, I know in, in Baghdad, it'd be Sunni and Shiites, and we would constantly constantly see fighting between them um the, there was even there was a stretch of road where there was the border and there would be school on one end school would be shot up kids still be going to school and then one day next morning you see a kid dead in the courtyard because they the other side shot in the courtyard of the kids i mean it's just it's really hard to to see i mean it just yeah but i don't know <laughs> No, man. Jesus Christ. I've never almost cried on this podcast like this, bro. Yeah, I just, um, the fact that you had to see that stuff just, uh, and it happened sucks. I don't know. I just, yeah, like you said, we all want uh, the world to be a better place and we all just want people to learn. So, um, you know, we, we can make, we can make the world a better place. And, you know, I don't know, man. I, I don't even, sometimes I feel like I, I that's why I did this podcast because I want people to learn and to hear stories like yours and you said it's a touchy subject, but people need to hear that because that's something that's actually happening. Mm -hmm. But I don't know, maybe you have advice for me. Like, I don't know, you know, like what can I do to help people? Like what can I do to, you know, to help some make someone's day better? It seems like all, all that I'm trying to do is useless when shit like that's happening in the world. Oh man, it's, um, <laughs> it's, I mean, that, we, we would ask ourselves the same question, but I mean, there's nothing we could do. I mean, even uh, the thing was, is that, yeah, we, we, if we saw someone, uh, an Iraqi national hurt, 
or they were dead, we couldn't do anything about it. Um, if there was a thing, if you were non-Muslim, you couldn't touch a dead Muslim's body. So sometimes the body would sit there for a week, a week or two. And we're like, I mean, we, so all we could do is call it in and say, Hey, um, yeah, come out. And we're like, no, we can't come out because if, if we do come out, they're going to, they're going to shoot us. So, it's yeah. like, oh, all right. I mean, would you rather, would you rather have us do it? I mean, no one's going to come up to us. I mean, we'll take care of it, but it's, it's a touchy subject religion. So, I mean, it was, I mean, it was um, even uh, during my second deployment, uh, I was in Kuwait and uh, I was on the, the port of Kuwait and it shared um, the U S and the Kuwaiti shared a base together. Um, the Kuwait soldiers had a mosque on the base. Um, but the thing was, is that none of the U S soldiers could even, first of all, they couldn't enter because they were non-Muslim, but they couldn't even walk on the sidewalk around other, uh, it was a big deal that if, a U.S. soldier walked on the sidewalk because the mosque was on that land. I mean, it was a. I mean, you got to respect it, but I mean, it's still it's still touchy and and, and it, it would be kind of funny when someone would actually do it. Like someone would be new on the base, they wouldn't know that rule, and it ends up happening, <laughs> and then it just turns into this big deal. Oh, well, I, I didn't know. I didn't. So yeah. It's a, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I guess I guess there's always ways. Like he didn't know. Like and, and there's ways to diffuse it too. And I'm sure you. I'm sure you learn how to communicate with people better too, and how to diffuse. I mean, if you can diffuse a situation like that, you can kind of diffuse someone being a you know a dick at the post office. Yeah, uh, yeah but I, and but the thing is, like, well, then if that's the case, put up signs. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, just the U.S. is hey, don't go, don't walk on the sidewalk. <laughs> There's no signs that say don't walk on the sidewalk, and right, and you end up having this conver confrontation, which. Um, think smarter not harder that's what i think yeah absolutely one of the th things about the the conflict over there uh you mentioned the sunni and the shiite muslims uh th that's the type of thing that just makes me think too like you know when people are all when people say oh, the, the whole world was one race or the whole world was one religion there wouldn't be any fighting they're both muslim and, and they're still fighting and, and you know it's just kind of proof right there that no matter what people are going to are, are gonna are gonna fight what are, what are, what exactly for the you know people who don't know may <laughs> you know what what is all the conflict over there about like why are we still over there who's fighting i think it's confusing to a lot of people too especially since we've been over there for so long um that that's one thing uh that a lot of people ask me and um the hard truth is when i was there they didn't want us to leave um we gave them stuff. Uh, I know during my second deployment, we're, we're, um, they wanted to get the troops out, but the Iraqis were saying, no, 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 stay here, stay here. We want this, we want that. Um, they, we would give them water. I think I, an Iraqi soldier was allowed two, two liters of water a day. That was to drink bathe and wash your face or wash any of your clothes so think about that two liters of water that you had to do all wipe wipe yourself when you go to the bathroom that was another thing um we would that was that was what they were getting from their government but being on the same basis with us they would ask for the water like hey can i get a water can i get a water you know i'm thirsty you know but, i mean that that was the main thing i saw why we weren't leaving is because the iraqi um, army didn't want us to leave because we were there to give give stuff to them and then what would end up happening a lot of the times is that we would give them takeover I know my second deployment we had the Iraqis coming with us on these route clearance missions so we could teach them but they would always say oh no 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 we can't do it ourselves we need you to come with us you know and like well you gotta you gotta do it yourself if you want to <laughs> If you want to be your own, you want to be your own country, you got to do it yourself. So that, that was the main thing that I saw. It wasn't anything like we wanted to stay there. It was just kind of like, well, they need our help. But I think it was just, it's like that kid that constantly wants something because you're giving them stuff. So 
that's that's on my opinion yeah and that's important too because there, you know there's um look there's a lot of reasonable points out there that we're there to protect assets things like that but you know we are doing a lot of good stuff over there too like what you guys are doing you know giving those soldiers waters is really important because the way that the you know the country is now and that you know partially it might be our fault from back in the day but you know it's important that we stay there and, and help them out and take those mines out that are there um you know give them water and show them things what what would happen if we left completely um it would probably be uh the same way it happened when we first went in what uh what was it um when we first invaded uh iraq um when the fighting was going on a lot of the iraqi soldiers uh took off their uniforms and ran they they didn't want to deal with it it was just too overpowering so that was another thing that we noticed because they would run the checkpoints uh, on the streets you know they would check people's ids and everything's like that sometimes there would be a, a firefight happen on that checkpoint the iraqi soldiers would take their clothes off leave their weapons and then run off they most of the times they wouldn't even fight so it's i don't know it was, that was a that was a big problem that we were having because we would come up across checkpoints and there'd be no iraqi soldiers there we'd be under there's weapons and uniforms laying on the ground you know so it's like it's a uh, if if you want if you want to help yourself or if you want things to be better you got to help yourself and i think that's one of the things that was lacking while i was there i've been out 10 years so i can't say for what's been going on the last 10 years maybe yeah that sorry <laughs> what was that maybe it's changed i don't know yeah yeah it's rough it's such a you know it's such a complicated position being in too cuz you guys have so had so much responsibility um you're you're over there I, I think a lot of times we don't even like know what's going on like politically and, but you guys are there militarily and it's such a weird juxtaposition to be in and you, you know do you do you question yourself a lot while you're over there do you question like motives things like that um some of the times i did uh i do explain it all um we we lost four guys my first deployment and um Jesus, maybe about six on six other wounded that couldn't continue mission. So sometimes we'd be like, man, it was like, <laughs> like, what are we going to do, man? We all, well, we got to, well, we got to go back out there. We got to go back out there. It was like, oh, man, it just be like, really? <laughs> we were like, it hasn't even been 24 hours and got to go back out there. So a lot of the times, most of we were defeated, but hey, we just got a job to do. So we go out and do it. So. Yeah. And I'm sure, uh, uh, the guy I interviewed for this podcast, it'll be out a few episodes before this one. His name's Mark Schultz. He's an Olympic champ world wrestler. Uh, wrestler. Um, one of the things we talked about, wrestlers say this all the time, is once you wrestle, everything else in life is easy. Well, once you've done what you've done, Eric, I'm sure everything else in life kind of seems like, well, I, I did this. I, I you know, got blown up a few times. I've seen some of the worst things a human can possibly imagine seeing, you know, it's got to be like things are kind of, you know, things are pr pretty easy relatively. Is it a hard adjustment to come back? Uh, if the first couple, I mean, the first three, three, four years, it was a culture shock because living in Germany and living in I in Iraq for two years, uh, street signs in English was a um, was like a complete change for me when I got back. Uh, either reading in German or I'm reading in Arabic. So it's like, yeah, that, that was a big thing. Um, just getting used to, I don't know, daily life. I, I was always kind of short fused and things like that. And I realized I had to be more and more patient with people. Uh, when I came back, I thought people were just dumb. <laughs> like, like really? I, um, in the military, I mean, you're, what's expected of you is perfection. I mean, if, you, if you're not going to do it right, we'll put you somewhere we'll put you in a job where you can't do nothing dumb like you go take pictures of things or things like that or yeah we'll go uh go move the boxes somewhere or something like that i mean but it, it, 
um, that's another thing that uh, the military is expects a lot of you. So it expects top people. I mean, if you're not going to have the top people do it, then what, how can we say our military is great, you know? And then kind of a high, like people say that the military should be for everybody. Yeah, it should be for everybody, but there's going to be a lot of expected of you. Don't come crying <laughs> when right. they expect a lot out of you. If if you can't do it, then you can't do it. And some, some people end up getting out because um, they just can't take it anymore. They, they do, they might do something stupid and then they get out that way. But yeah, I know uh when uh obama took over he lowered the standards of uh of people coming in and some of the people we got really had no business being there so it was kind of like really we we don't want to be you don't want to be with people that are just gonna flake on you you want people that are going to be by your side and dig it out with you yeah absolutely absolutely like and that is scary too because there's there's always looming threats of other superpowers, Russia and China. You want, mm -hmm. um, not that it's always good to have this in every form, but I think for the military, it's, it might be, and maybe I'm using this term wrong, so I'm sorry, because it might sound worse than I actually mean it to. It might be important to have some sort of, you know, like American exceptionalism. Like we should have, like you said, the best people going in there. Um, you know, the, 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 the top people, ethic like you know people that are going in there with good ethics people that are going in there intellectually people that are going there that are good physically that, that can do all these things and it's important to have that because it's not just each other like we're you're, you're not just the american people relying on you guys it's each other because you are americans it's the it's the people in other countries that you're meant to protect too you were in germany you were in iraq you know there's people who relied on you guys it's important that we have like the best of the best sincerely but uh Spe you know kind of speaking on what you said about like you can get like jobs that are just taking pictures things like that a, a lot of times because in movies it's so you know everything's so hyperbole people think that every day of being in the military's platoon or apocalypse now what a lot of people don't talk about is the boredom oh yeah it's uh the, the motto of the army is uh hurry up and wait so hey, we got to do something. Let's get it right done right now. And then you wait half the day and you're like, really, we could have took our time instead of just rushing through it. And then when it finally, t finally does come time to do something, they're like, oh, this is wrong. I'm like, well, you should have told us that well, yeah, while we were doing it, you know, instead of us sitting here all day. But yeah, the, the boredom is kind of the thing. Cause I like uh, in Germany, um, we, we didn't have uh, American television. We would have, I think the only channels we had was maybe um, CNN, Fox, ESPN, a couple of like Comedy Central, things like that. Those were the only channels that we had, but we also didn't have American commercials. We had military commercials. And this would be like the, like, <laughs> like the, be be rated think about the worst probably studio you could think of and they made a commercial like what is this <laughs> type of thing and it would be the same 10 commercials all the time so you could literally sit there and repeat the whole commercial because you've seen it so many times there, there'd be times i would kill for a geico commercial or a beer commercial at that but i'm hearing military history or i'm hearing about the military bank or something like that it's just and just worst, worst, um, I don't know how you say it, uh, um, video footage you would ever see. Yeah. It's like training videos, like for, um, when you go for like a nine exactly. to five there you go. job. There you, go. you go for like a restaurant job or something like that. You get, listen to training videos. <laughs> That's like, yeah. And there's something very dystopian about that too, almost, you know, where it's like, um, I, like it's kind of almost like 1984 where like the only commercials you're seeing are like military based and it's you know it's like make sure you join the military bank and it's yeah some of that that's crazy and yeah you guys don't get enough credit for how and like sincerely i mean this how bored you guys have have to be most of the time because it's not always action a lot of it um one of my favorite quotes i'm gonna get it wrong is from jarhead when he's like 
what you do in the military because you get bored, you masturbate, you get bored, and then you masturbate again. And it's like very, <laughs> it, it, I was like, oh, like that, that helped me, you know, I don't know how accurate that movie is, but it helped me like understand a little bit more. Um, before we go, before we do the plugs and everything, I got to ask, what military movie or show do you think is, have you, that you've seen, if you watch them, has been the most accurate? Uh, I really can't watch military movies. Um, <laughs> I understand. Uh, I, I would I would sit there and be like, I'd, I'd be I'd be in the movie theater and watching it. And I'd be like, wrong, wrong. Yeah. <laughs> like, like out loud too. <laughs> I mean, like people are like, <laughs> what? They're like wrong, wrong, wrong. So, uh, Jarhead is a good one. Uh, they they the psychological part. Jarhead did a good job. Um, another one is actually American Sniper. Uh, the details that they, they put in there, like I would, I would see things in there um, that would just blow my mind. So uh, there's a scene in there. He, uh, Chris Kyle, walks into his into his uh, hooch, and uh, he opens the door. Well, if you notice, when he opens the door, there's a string that comes across the top. And there's a water bottle weighing down the door so it stays closed. That's every door in Iraq. Wow. So just that those details were, were blew my mind. Um, what, um, Saving Private Ryan's another good one uh, with the engineers when they stormed Normandy and things like that. Uh, well, there, there's a few, there's a few military movies that we, we don't uh, dare say are any good. <laughs> yeah, well, when that comes to mind, and like again, like I don't know anything I'm talking about, but in comparison, like behind enemy lines with Owen Wilson sounds like it would not be a good one. Uh, and I and I understand what you're saying because as a like you know I was a wrestler, and every time I watch a movie where there's wrestling in it, or like it's in a show when they do a pin, they count to three, and that never happens. I don't know if you've ever watched yeah, high school I, wrestling, or you yeah, wrestled I, I used to. I used to, yeah well. We used to share the gym at my high school. I was on, I played basketball. So the wrestlers would practice and yeah, they would never say, you know, one, they don't say one, two, three or anything like that. Yeah. As soon as your both shoulders touch the mat, it's a pen. And like, it's like, that's a, I love WWE, but that's a WWE thing. And <laughs> yeah, so I understand, it's like so frustrating and I, I completely get that. Um, but Eric, it has been an absolute pleasure talking to you. This has definitely been my most emotional episode and uh, you've got a lot of great, thoughts and you're a good guy and you're very wise and, and stoic which i really appreciate um plug whatever you want here the book social media anything this is your opportunity take as much time as you need uh yeah so as i said my book right now uh bomb hunter story my life clearing the roads of iraq uh it's on amazon uh it's for paperback and ebook um um on that i'm also on goodreads also uh, you just have to type in my book's name and then my author page will come up. Um, other than that, I'm, I am a, I am a millennial, but I'm one of the old millennials. So when I was in Germany and things like that, that's when Twitter and YouTube and all that stuff started coming out and iPhones. Yeah. So I'm still, I'm still old school stuck in the eighties. So social media is a new thing for me too. Hey, all good. So we're going to put, you know, that link to that book is going to be in the description below on Spotify. The name of the book will be there. And um, uh, so last thing I ask my guests every single episode is we want to get more people reading. So um, other than your own, could you please suggest a book or a quote that you really love? Ooh, all right. Um, yeah, this is, it's always a hard question. People are always like, oh, man. <laughs> uh, quote. Uh, Jesus. Um, The one thing I always have, I have it in my, I have it in my front yard. Uh, it says, uh, freedom isn't free. You got to work. Nothing's free. That's amazing. I love it. Simple and incredibly beautiful. Eric, thank you so much. Um, and uh, yeah, goodbye. another, another, another thing is, uh, if you pick up my book, uh, get ready to laugh, cry and have some fun. Absolutely. And that's, you know, we want all those emotions when we read. So everyone, please buy the book. Christmas is coming up. Give it as a gift for someone if, you know, if, if you're not a reader, but make sure you read it. 
And uh, thank you again, Eric. And um, goodbye. No, thanks for having me. Bye. Bye.